The young always have the same problem, how to rebel and conform at the same time. They have solved this by defying their parents and copying one another. So said Quentin Crisp. He also pointed out that the strange thing about camp is that it has been fossilised. The mannerisms have never changed. If I were now to see a woman sitting with her knees clamped together, one hand on her hip and the other lightly touching her at the back of her hair, I should think either that she scored her last social triumph in 1926, or it is a man in drag. I mention this because there is something archly camp about social justice. You have the progressives who appear not to notice or care that their arguments are simply hollow parodies of arguments from the 1960s and 70s. It is often questionable if those arguments had relevance then. Some of them were obviously paranoid delusions, but at least they had the merit of being winning arguments. And opposing them are anti-progressives. I call them this because it would be wrong to call those opposing social justice conservatives. Many are old-school socialists or various forms of liberal, or just people like myself who cannot read the headlines on the Guardian opinion page without a roll of the eyes and an admission that life is too short and I too sentient to waste my time reading the article. Another reason for quoting Quentin Crisp, whose social commentaries are the equal of Orwell or Woodhouse, is that increasingly the progressives have taken on the camp persona of Mary Whitehouse. To those who don't know, Mrs Whitehouse achieved recognition in the 1950s when she wrote an article for the Sunday Times advising mothers how they might best steer their offspring away from the perils of homosexuality. She then went on to found the National Viewers and Listeners Association, a slacktivist group, to use the modern parlance, who would bombard the BBC, in particular, with letters whenever they saw or heard anything they didn't like or thought it corrupting of the nation's morals. Among the things she and her cohorts complained about were Benny Hill, war reporting that showed dead bodies, footage of the liberation of Belson, the Chuck Berry song My ding ling and Doctor Who, who she described as tea-time brutality for tots. She was, in short, a woman with a big at, to use the vernacular, and oddly enough she had trendy glasses and sometimes wore blue hair. And what she also shares in common with those camply aping her is about the only lasting legacy her activism has had on society is it is now littered with various committees and boards providing work for other women with big hats, trendy glasses and blue hair. Oh, and various memes have gone rogue in the wild without the slightest foundation in fact. To wit, the dangers of pornography, which was one of many things Mrs Whitehouse railed against. Now consider for a minute what the average consumer of porn would get in the 1960s and 70s. The magazine would have four or five spreads of photos of reasonably fed, healthy young women, a page of dirty jokes, an article about cars, another on a famous battle, a couple of opinion pieces by someone like Norman Mailer or Gore Vidal, and then maybe some adverts for blow-up dolls, sex toys and various creams and pills for improved performance. It was all rather respectful, if for no other reason than if you shot your load over the pictures you would end up with a piece of cardboard and your dad would belt you for nicking his porn mags. Fast forward today, to today, and well, it's all rather different. Though some things remain the same, with the current government proposing that there should be a clamp down on porn because, well, because, but only on pictures, not on the legion of porn available on Kindle that is consumed by women, because as we know, there is nothing so corrupting to the public morals as a woman in her knickers, or not, laying on a bed and pouting. Kindle tales of nubile women having sex with Bigfoot why that is educational 
and will no doubt lead to someone claiming it is the reason women have better reading abilities and boys are going blind. Oh, and at the height of Mrs. Whitehouse's fame, she bought an action for blasphemy against gay news for a poem it printed by James Kirkup, in which a Roman soldier has sexual fantasies about the dead body of Jesus and some other stuff like Jesus having sex with his disciples and Pontius Pilate, which when you think about it gives a whole new twist to his hand washing. Now, you can tell that by bringing this lawsuit Mrs Whitehouse was drunk on power, like SG, SJWs these days complaining about scientist shirts the size of pixel tits or cancelling Colbert, when the focus of her anger is a poem. The English hate poetry, and generally for good reason. And you can argue that the poem was tasteless in its subject matter, but it's slightly odd to consider it blasphemous. Well, that is until you recall that Mrs Whitehouse was virulent in her hatred of shirtlifters and backdoor bandits. So how dare gays profane our saviour? Completely ignoring the fact that the profanity of Jesus' death is the reason for the atonement of sins, and by extension the more profane it is, the more sins are wiped away. Anyhow, she won the case, but as the spectator observed, the prosecution was perverse the verdict misguided. As for the punishments given, as this was in effect a test case, they were excessive, and it left the law on obscenity even more muddled and confused than it was before, and has served no useful purpose whatsoever except to delight Mrs Whitehouse, which rather sums up so many of those camping it up as Mrs Whitehouse today.